Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody to the next instalment of Talking Naturally. I'm Professor Annie Tindley, one of the trustees of NHSN, and it's my absolute privilege and honour to be talking to Paul Morrison. Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Paul Morrison. Um, I've been around a long time. I'm 72 years of age, but throughout my life I've been interested in wildlife, so uh, I'm still doing it, still going strong and uh, no intention of retiring. I currently work for the RSPB as the site manager on Coquit Island, just off the Northumberland coast. And I've been hanging around that place for, this is my 37th year of involvement with helping with Coquit Island. Amazing, thanks Paul. Uh, so, so a, a long life in natural history. Um, how did you first get into it then? Strange. Uh, I, used to, I used to go to school at Tynemouth and uh, one lunchtime I was down on the beach. My parents used to come down and, and uh, go for walks along the, the beach and we came across an oiled guillemot. Uh, I must have been about nine or ten in those days. And uh, we brought this little guillemot home and I looked after it and I sought the help from a local naturalist around the corner in High Heaton where I used to live. And uh, we weren't very successful, but it gave me an insight into looking after or caring for, for wildlife. And it, um, uh, I think that's what started me in the first place with, with that interest. It came back into my life many years later because I was a perpetual student for many years. Uh, I, I first went to university in 1968, but I didn't emerge till uh, 1981, something like that. But in, in the middle of that, um, I, I secured a job as a research technician at the Oil Seabird Rehabilitation Unit at Newcastle University, headed up by a guy called John Croxall, who went down to the Antarctic Survey after that. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and all, all about looking after oil seabirds, it, it, it just came back into focus again and, and refocused my interest in wildlife, shall we say. Wonderful. So, so this perpetual student life, <laughs> was it kind of um, natural history kind of subjects you were studying or was it something completely different when you were there? Um, it was a, a, a mixture really. Uh, oh. I, I started at zoology um, and, 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 and I enjoyed that, that course. It was all at Newcastle University and, uh, uh, and when, once I finished that degree, uh, that, then I got to secure the job at the Oil Seabird Unit and I loved it. I just loved that job. Uh, it brought me around Northumberland and elsewhere, looking after collecting oil birds, cleaning them, helping to research how to clean them more efficiently. And, uh, uh, and then uh, I was looking for a job after that because the seabird unit closed and, and I did what a lot of people did, went back to university. So I ended up studying applied science uh, in public health engineering. So it was water quality, things like that. And I finished that and, and I don't know, I drifted into a PhD. So I, I did a PhD in engineering, so uh, I, I didn't, as I say, I didn't emerge from Newcastle. It was it was a very uh, enjoyable academic life, really. Uh, I, didn't yeah, I, know, I, can, I can only approve of a long career at Newcastle University. So. <laughs> oh, it was a wonderful time. Yeah, wonderful time. <laughs> I'm, wonderful. I'm interested in the um, oil seabird unit. Was that was that born out of uh, the series of events of oil spills in the sea, or why was that kind of why was there a kind of a a gathering of expertise in Newcastle at that time. It was really a, um, an effort on behalf of the oil companies following the Torrey Canyon. And uh, at that time, there wasn't a lot of knowledge around how to look after uh, in, injured or, or oil seabirds. So it was funded by the oil companies as a, a way of them saying, look, we are doing something for, for wildlife and nature. And it was set up at Newcastle University and it just by, by chance, it was within the same department, zoology department, that I was studying. And when I emerged from that department, uh, that job was going. So I, I was lucky I got it. Um, oh, yeah. I haven't looked back really since then. Brilliant. That's fantastic. So you, you mentioned there you got, when you found your oil guillemot, that you'd got some advice from a naturalist in high heating. But w were there any other people that kind of inspired your early interest or helped guide you in that early interest in natural history? I, I don't think so. I, I think it came naturally. I, 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 went to, I went to school by the sea. My playground was the, the beach and the, the rocks. So I, it just evolved as I grew up, really. 
um yeah. it was yeah. in me really so that, that that's how it happened just being outside and enjoying the environment and yes that's yes I mean, I mean some of my most memorable play times were with one of my other friends john Steele, who you may know uh we went to school together and we used to go to paddy freeman's park in high heaton as little kids and, and trying to catch voles things like that so we were <laughs> Naughty little boys, but uh, you know, we, we had an interest in, in looking at wildlife, not damaging it, but just exploring. So it, it was, you know, I was just lucky it, it, it happened. Yeah, and it shows you as well that you can you can access that even in a kind of quite an urban environment as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Paddy Freeman's Park and lots of woodland and uh, and grasslands and, you know, exploring was just, it just came naturally, really. Yeah. So, and, and now, obviously, you work for the RSPB now and... And, and but you know you have this kind of passion for birds in particular and so, so where does that kind of interest come from in, in, in birds in particular and what kinds of areas are you most interested in? Well I, I was never, never a, a twitcher or a bird watcher okay. um, so, so it, 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 again it happened by accident uh, I was working at a country park at uh, Druridge Bay mm -hmm. and uh, and I got to know some of the boatmen that ran provisions out to Cogod Island. That's a long time ago. And uh, I was standing at the quayside and one, one of the skippers said, Paul, do you want to come and give a hand to load the boat and help help us take it out? We've got a lot of equipment to take out. Oh yes, that's a, a good excuse to see the island. Uh, mm -hmm. Thousands of people want to see that island and they can't, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I was one of them. So uh, I took it out there and it, it happened to be in the summertime. We, we landed this gear for, for the lighthouse for the keepers on the jetty and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing, just the thousands of seabirds from puffins to terns to ida. And it, wow, it just grabbed me and uh, it stayed with me ever since really. Um, so that's how it began. It was thanks to the lighthouse keepers and the, the, uh, the uh, service boatmen. Yeah, just giving you a chance to go out there and actually see for yourself yeah. what, what, what was there. I, I think, think that happens for lots of people. You get an opportunity and, and it suddenly strikes a chord. Um, that's, and that's right. how it happened with me and and then soon I got to know the the RSPB warden who was a, a solo person on the island in those days mm -hmm. because with having lighthouse keepers there they could be on the island solo after automation uh, I, I started getting more involved I, I was already going regularly and uh, because you needed two people on the island for health and safety yeah. and then I, I've always been a busy chap I, I sort of run two jobs into one I was a country park warden and then uh, I worked for the county county council as the Northumberland Coast Management Officer for about eight years, but alongside that, I was still doing one day a week on Cocod Island. So, I was helping with the work there. I was actually paid for by by that time by the RSPB. Started as a volunteer, but I sort of drifted into working one day a week because in those days, when the warden finished working on that island, they they shut the lighthouse down where they were staying, and. Uh, everything stopped until the next spring. And that knowledge and, and experience for those guys that moved on uh, was lost. So they wanted someone to have a little bit of continuity in the system. So I was the guy chosen to, to, to be uh, the continuity for Cocod Island. And, and then it grew from there. I was working with the county council full time and then two days a week with the RSPB and it was getting a bit busy. So I went part-time with the RSPB, uh, with the county council and uh, part-time with the RSPB. Uh -huh. And then finally, uh, one fortunate day, I mean, I, I worked for the county council in various hats from head warden to coast management officer to country park ranger. Um, uh, I, I finally took um, what they call voluntary redundancy oh, after yeah. 29 and a half years. And the next day, the RSPB phoned me up and I was put through my, my paces and I secured the job permanently with the RSPB. So I went from working in a, an office with about 50 people to working on an island with 20,000 puffins. So it was uh, <laughs> heaven, really. I mean, that's, that's, why, that's, why I'll never, <laughs> that's why I'll never retire. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. And so um, I suppose, what, what would you say are the biggest positives about working on the island and what would be the more challenging aspects, do you say? Uh, without a doubt, uh, we'll do the challenge first. Mm -hmm. I mean, the weather we've just had, you know, the, the weather is always a challenge. Yeah. Um, all the team that, that help on Cogod Island, work on Cogod Island, live on Cogod Island, volunteer on Cogod Island, they're all very special people and they don't do nine till five. 
that there's no such thing. Uh, we have to work the weather, uh, we have to work the tides, and we have to work the seasons, what, what jobs need doing when. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a challenge getting, enabling that to happen. I was out the island yesterday in between the, the bad weather to secure some equipment and take it off for a, a training course on Friday. And it was a very, you might call it a bumpy ride. It was a very bumpy ride, but we got the gear off and, <laughs> and it was, it's, it's reading the sea just as well because it was, it's back to rough again today. So it, it's a bit of a challenge just keeping that, it's a, it's a, in the summer, it's a perfect commute, a commute to work on a rubber dinghy. What can be better than that? Well, but in the winter time, it becomes more of a, uh, a demanding uh, job really uh, yeah. and luckily I've got a, a team around me that all think the same way so uh, it works well right. uh, on the on the positive side wow <laughs> Island, uh, you, you you set off right, on a little rubber dinghy and there's no other no cars no nothing involved you pass the odd fishing boat and uh, <laughs> it's a mile offshore two kilometers it might as well be a hundred miles offshore because when you get there and you set foot on that on that jetty, even in the winter time, all you hear is the odd little dog bark or something in the distance, and it's another world out there. And even at this time of the year, it's a special place because uh, it's where the overwintering or birds in passage call off because they know it's a it's a peace and quiet place. It's yeah. actually a sanctuary. It's not just a reserve. It's a nature sanctuary. Yeah. So yeah, so so being there transports you away from, I'm not say the real world, but to another world. A different world and and I wonder as well from from that time when you first set foot on the island and, and started to get to know it to now what do you think have been the big changes if there, or if there have been any big changes to the wildlife to the birds or or, or or just the sort of life of the island generally? I think in the early days I'll say the early days um, monitoring the island which is a tremendous amount of work goes on in the in the during the breeding season to find out exactly how many birds are there, how many species, where they nest, how many, um, <clears throat> what's their clutch size, what the, their productivity is, what the, the success. Um, all that work was taking place in those days, but it seems to have um, got more and more intensive as mm. the bird numbers increase and Cocot is becoming uh, what has become the sole place for finding roseate terns, Britain's rarest nesting seabird. So from a, a very little known island, it's only eight hectares um, in, in the early days, the, the difference now is that most people that know their birds or know a lot about wildlife will say, whoa, Cocot Island. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it's become, I'll, I'll say it's internationally uh, known now, um, mm -hmm. which is rather nice because we can share that specialness with other, lots of other people technology helps us. The other big change, of course, is the, the way of life on the island was very basic, living in a shed. The shed blew down oh, in a storm six years ago. Right. That, that had lasted since 1970, since it became a, a, a nature reserve. Right. Uh, and it was a nature reserve thanks to the, the work of the Natural History Society, of course. Um, it was they who had the, the foresight to see the potential of Cocot Island. And it was the RSPB that were lucky enough to take on the role of, of managing the island. So it's gone from a, a little known place to now a hub of activity. Puffins there used to be something in the region of 8,000 pairs. Now we're looking at 30,000 pairs. Wow. 30,000 puffins. Wow. It should be called Puffin Island. <laughs> and then, of course, you've got all the other species as well. So um, they're, they're big changes in the wildlife we, we've seen over the time. The vegetation's changed too. Um, when I first started there, it was just a very thin covering of uh, maritime turf, mm -hmm. easy for idas to nest in, easy for puffins to create their burrows through. Now it's dominated by Yorkshire fog and uh, a, a lot more nettle, nettle beds, which means the vegetation management's quite intensive now as well. So that's another vast change, huge amount of time involved now in, in looking after the the, uh, the, the nesting areas for the birds. I think on the human side, the, the biggest change for us was when the lighthouse was automated in 1990. To me, it was a really sad time. I was um, uh, uh, on their last year, I took a Christmas tree out and the, the lighthouse uh -huh. was in the, in the throes of um, being dismantled internally. Uh, and we actually put the, the Christmas tree up in the lantern room 
We didn't dare put lights on it in case it confused fishermen. But uh, the, the way of life of the lighthouse keeper uh, dovetailed with the way of the wardens. They, they, they yeah. called us the blooming bird wardens and, uh, and uh, we used to always be cheeky about the, our existence in a shed. But they were, they were at hearts of gold. They, they, they provided all the facilities for the, for the warden staff, you know, essential things like the loo and yeah. water and things like that. Um, so when, when they finished, it, it, um, it was a very strange, uh, quiet time because we always had fun with the keepers. They were always up. If I was working one day on the island and I'd said, I have to get off on the morning tide, is they said, well, it's four o'clock in the morning, Paul, we'll wake you up. And I said, oh, great. So, you know, they, they were my alarm clock to, to companions and, and good friends as well. Yeah. I think the next physical change on the island came when, uh, when it was automated, it became uh, powered, it was powered by diesel generators. Right. That then changed in 2007 to solar power. And that was a mega change in, in, in our thinking because there was always a generator humming in the background. It was yeah. just a lasting memory. Wherever I was on the island, I used to come back to the lighthouse to our, our new accommodation in the old quarters of the engineers, because mm -hmm. that was vacated now. So that was a big change, moving from a shed to a lighthouse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the drum of the, of the diesel engine was always present. And the, the day they switched it off, it was, there was an eerie silence across the island and it took a long time to get used to that. I used to wake up in the night thinking, oh, the generator's off. And uh, I did course, actually yeah. uh, secure a job with Shinty House for a couple of years as one of their attendants. And I loved it because I could get up the lighthouse. I could just be part of that Victorian engineering. There's yes. a lot of it still there, but I could also observe the birds from the, do my counts from the roof of the top of the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. um, but sadly that wasn't to last because they, they made all the attendants redundant and to put it out to contract. But I enjoyed the short time I was there. But um, so it's a, it's a it's a a place of lots of secrets as well. You know the the, yeah. the stories that go on in Cocod Island that the, the lighthouse keepers pass on, the history of the place. I mean the lighthouse is built on top of a monastery, so the history of the place is incredible. There's even a Napoleonic battery in one corner, which is a listed building, that the then Duke of Northumberland. Um, he paid for out of his own pocket to, uh, to a garrison on Cockett Island to protect Northumberland from the French. And, it, <laughs> and, and the, the battery's still there to this day. And the okay. monastery is sadly has a lighthouse built on top of it, but there's lots of it still there. Underneath there's a crypt, the first floor of the old chapel is still there. So oh. there's a wonderful historical mix alongside the natural history mix. The natural mix. And you, you mentioned there um, is so fascinating, but one of the things that jumped out, so is the massive increase in puffin numbers. Is that generally speaking for the bird species? Have you seen an increase or have there been some that have been got in trouble over the um, decades you've been there? The puffins, that suddenly changed about four years ago. And I, I think it, it ties in with the problems the puffins are having around the coast of Scotland with the loss of sand eels, their staple diet. Mm -hmm. And the sand eels are disappearing because with the, the warming seas, the, uh, the sand eels aren't successful, therefore the puffins can't feed. So I'm pretty sure there's a bit of displacement being going on. Uh, we're lucky on the Northumberland coast and up to the Isle of May that the sea off the Northumberland coast is fairly cold and uh, sand eels still thrive. Uh, we're to worrying, worry about the um, fishery on sand eels that was threatening this year, mm -hmm. but, but the sand eels are plentiful at the moment and therefore the birds are plentiful so the birds that feed on sand eels terns kittiwakes um mm -hmm. the puffins of course they're doing very very well and the numbers are going up and up and up right. part of the research on coquit is to look at the trends of the different species over the years and uh, we've been doing that well right back since the start of the when it became a, a sanctuary and uh, we're now in the process of sharing that knowledge with other conservation bodies up and down the coast it's all very well having a haven for birds at Cocod Island. There's also one at the Farn Islands and there's Long Nanny and there's uh, the, the uh, Holy Island, of course. So we're now sharing our data to look at the whole issue of just how well the birds are doing overall. Because they could be doing very well on Cocod, but they could be doing terribly somewhere else. So we need to know, we need to be guided just exactly mm -hmm. how well things are going. Mm -hmm. And do you, think, do, you think, do you think overall it has been a bit a challenging time for biodiversity and, and species? I mean, have you noticed that over the course of your lifetime in natural history? Or is there other things to be maybe 
um, optimistic about. Well, I've, I've seen the uh, the changes taking place, of course, with the, the vegetation was the main um, warning to us. It, it means that we have to do more to safeguard the species that we have. We have to be prepared to accept that some species just won't survive, but others will take their place. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, you would get the, a little egret in the south of England. Now you see them nearly every day on the mainland on the Northumberland coast. So mm -hmm. things are changing within our lifetime. And uh, we're doing our best to manage and balance that, mm -hmm. as are the other conservation bodies too. Yeah. And a, long, a, a thing that's changed in the last few years is the willingness to work together as well. I think that's really important that we, we have to share our knowledge if we're going to keep pace with the changes. Yeah, absolutely. That's well, that in a sense, that collaboration is just so heartening to hear in itself. Um, and, and I think that's right. It's it, it's working together to get that that full picture, isn't it? And then and then make decisions on that basis. I suppose. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose um, one of my last questions would be, I mean, you know, you, you've had this incredible a lifetime of working in, in what you know what's clearly a very special place quite an unusual place uh, as well and I wondered if if you had any advice to give to a young person who was interested in natural history and wanted to get into it a bit more what would it be? I would say don't be deterred by all these degrees floating around <laughs> just <laughs> get yourself involved in, as a volunteer just to suss it out just to get a feel for what wildlife means to you as an individual mm -hmm. and if it hooks you 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 will just keep on doing what you're doing and trying to get uh, a job or a, a even a part-time job get yeah. on that ladder There's, there are lots of organizations um yeah. some are very practical ones on the ground others are more academic uh, you just have to discover what suits you best but don't give up because pff, i fell in it, 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 I was lucky enough to fall into it. Other people can do the same. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it, it is a, an, an all captivating way of life though. It, it does, uh, I think I'm speaking from my home. This, this is my office. You can see the clutter behind me. It's, um, um, they're, <laughs> they've got the point now where they're providing me with a new office so to, uh, to, to accommodate all the data and stuff that we've, we, we've got over the year. So Quite I've, right, got, too. I've, I've got another big job coming up in, in, uh, uh, over the rest of the winter to, to digitize a lot of the stuff, of course. A lot of it is, but a lot, a lot of raw data is still here. I've got an office at home and an office on the island because if I get stuck on the island, because I stay on the island uh, uh, at least once a week with my colleagues, they, they live there, but I, 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 I just stay there once, once or twice a week. Um, it's, uh, we need to be, uh, have the ability to keep on going. So some of the technical ch challenges over the years mm -hmm. has been a, a, a very evident as well. We still use paraffin lamps. I don't know if you remember, you're far too young to remember Tilly lamps, but we <laughs> still have Tilly lamps on Cocod Island. But wow. alongside Tilly lamps, we have, a, we have four solar panel systems. Um, we have a 12 volt, a 240 volt, wow. we have one to power the wildlife cameras and one to provide power for the, um, the CCTV. Those CCTV and wildlife cameras, that's another raft of technology where we can uh, guard the birds because sadly we have very rare birds and there are people that would dearly like to steal the eggs. So we have to staff the island 24 seven and we use all sorts of technology to help us achieve that. Yeah. But we also have wildlife cameras to share Cocod with the world because the world can't come to Cocod because it's a sanctuary. So we have to share it with with, uh, with the rest of the uh, the outside world. So the wildlife cams have been wonderful at that. We're expanding that system again this year. We even have a, a desalination unit. We we can we sa salvage water off the, the roof, store it in an underground tank, pump it up to a header tank and put it through a, a desalination unit. And we can produce our own drinking water on the island. And uh, uh, that's a, another major change in, in, in technology. So um, when you go on the island, looking around you think my word when you start looking in the crypts at the all the equipment we've got you think how on earth do you run all this stuff but yeah. uh, and 10 years ago you know 62 or whatever uh, i never dreamt that we'd be having virtual reality headset to share Pocket <laughs> island and and, and and all that technology around us and to keep pace with it and yeah. my, my, my good colleagues on the island 
thankfully uh, some of them are more adept at um the technology than i am and, and they uh, but they they share it and we, we it's all about sharing the knowledge on the island and uh, yeah. and working as a team and i think that's one thing that drives that island along its successful course is the fact that the team all think the same they help each other and uh, we, we even have christmas in the middle of the in the, in the middle of the year because the team dispersed a little bit in the winter time you don't have full staff oh. so we, we have to celebrate accordingly so our, our way of life is very different from the the rest of the world yeah that's so it's lovely you know yes and, and but yeah as you say you know everyone there sharing the expertise share you know addressing what needs to be done but you know you've obviously played an absolutely critical role in that yourself for many many years well yeah and and, and there's a, a secret ingredient as well it's fun nature <laughs> can be absolute fun to watch the puffins at play on the jetty and exploring and thing it's an absolute delight to be party to that yeah. you can sit on a hide and although you're looking for rings and reading ring numbers as part of the research uh you're witnessing wildlife at its best really yeah yeah well i think fun fun is the thing isn't it even i suppose in when there's gale force winds and and various challenges to face just remembering how much fun it is is it must keep you going in the depths of winter oh yeah yeah i got marooned a few years ago and it was wonderful i can um <laughs> when i was when i was in the house two days ago with storm was it arwin arwin oh uh, yeah I, th I thought my I thought my house was going to blow down. There's no fear of that on the lighthouse. It's three foot wall, thick walls. You know, it's um, it was built to last. Yeah. Excuse me. Well, thank you so much, Paul. That's absolutely inspiring. And well, to hear about the island and your role in it, and how how you got into that world, um, and and what sort of changed, and but what's remained the same is kind of those essentials about learning and collaboration all together. Um, so I just want to thank you on behalf of the Society for speaking to us. I'm sure we could have many follow-up conversations. Well, I'm sure. And, and my thanks go to the Society, of course, because without the Society, there wouldn't be a Cogadown Sanctuary. There wouldn't be the bird spectacle that we, that we enjoy today. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, hopefully we'll have a part two before too long. But thank you very much again, indeed. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you.